This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, James, for that reading. I love Isaiah's prophetic visions. I think they're really some of the most extraordinary parts of scripture that we have, certainly in the prophetic literature. And uh, this is a character who lived several hundred years before Christ appeared, and he offers extraordinary insights into the nature, the true nature of God's kingdom. As we enter Advent, it's good to remember that this is a season that celebrates the arrival of Jesus, his birth, but it's also much more than that. It's the expectation of the kingdom of God coming. So it's obviously closely tied to the arrival of Christ, but it's actually even more than that. And we're going to think about that this morning. In this passage, uh, we hear Isaiah refer to the mountain of the Lord. And this is a mountain that has variously been named in the scriptures, Mount Zion, my holy mountain, the temple of David, and simply Jerusalem. It gets called this from time to time. And the thing to know about this mountain is, it's not a mountain, it's a hill. It's actually quite a modest hill at that. You could probably accuse the prophet of making a mountain out of a molehill here. <laughs> but the prophetic designation of this fairly modest hill as a mountain is more as a metaphor than an objective description. This is a place, have you, are you familiar with the term umphalus? Anyone know what an umphalus is? Umphalus. It's a belly button. That's <laughs> It's good to know. Uh, it's a place where the nutrients flow from the mother to the unborn child. It's considered the uh, very key place. And uh, in the spiritual world, in lots of religions actually, this term umphalus, they have big monuments and things, as the notion of this is a place where the, the divine interaction with earth happens. And Mount Zion, the, the holy mountain, was considered the umphalus where God interacted with the rest of the world, came and revealed himself uh, to the people of Israel. So while many or any geographic observer would see a hill, the importance of this place is monumental. It is a mountain and people will notice and see its importance. And not just notice, they will be drawn towards it. Isaiah, Isaiah sees streams of people people from all the nations of the world streaming towards this holy mountain. And the only way I can imagine a response like this is if it went viral somehow. You know, things go viral, not just viruses, but um, you know, when you, you tell your friends something and they tell their friends and it, it all goes really wild and everyone gets very excited about it. The most uh, shared message on social media at the beginning of this year was a little article with a headline that said, suspected human trafficker, child predator may be in our area. And this little article went viral, particularly in the United States. And you can see why a, a message like that would be shared widely, because it triggers our concern about safety, doesn't it? What, what, there's, there's a predator in the area, are the kids safe? You know, and there's a deep sort of our, our, limb, our brain's limbic system gets activated to be protective. And this is one of the most instinctual things we have as human beings. We want to be safe and protect our own and this kind of thing. And those things go viral really easily. That's why we, uh, news bulletins always tell us all the bad news and at the end, just to cheer us up, they tell us about the cat that got rescued from the tree. Making good news go viral is so much more difficult. How do you get something positive to be shared in a way that people just have to share it? Can you imagine something so profoundly good that the very nature of this goodness does not create in you a desire to hoard it and be greedy with it, but actually to share it and tell others about it and give it out to people 
an abundance that leads to unbridled generosity. How good would that goodness need to be to get you to do that? It's not what we've come to expect of human beings, is it? From our observations of the way life works, Human beings don't kind of do that naturally. Indeed, I suspect for most of us it's quite difficult to imagine something that would be so good that we would feel so automatically moved to just share generously in relation to it. A goodness that so transforms those that it touches that it reverses a self-protecting instinct into a self-giving almost instinct. How can we conceive of something that transforms us so deeply that reverses our very sense of where life is to be found. I mean, we barely have vocabulary for it, I reckon. Uh, a transformation like that has to reach for religious words, words like repentance being turned around, or conversion being transformed somehow. Maybe even a concept like being born again. It's so outside our natural experience. But this is what Isaiah sees, people streaming to the house of the Lord because they want to learn of the ways of God. Transformation doesn't happen overnight, never does. We always have to learn things and be taught things and make lots of little decisions and learn new habits and slowly but surely uh, we will get transformed. First we need teaching, someone to show us the way and then to explain it to us and demonstrate it to us and maybe even model it for us. I have probably shared some of my story of fathering and I will confess to you I am not a very natural father. I didn't have a very good model of a father. I love my dad very much, my late father, but he was pretty absent in my upbringing. And so when it came to being a father, I had a sense of panic about how to do that and I looked around for models, things that I thought were worthwhile following, and I found a few. Actually, there's some people in the congregation here that have helped me substantially in my fathering as well. And one guy in particular, an old friend, uh, lives in the Northern Beaches, Gary, if you're listening. Um, he provided for me a really, really good model of how to be a father. I could just watch the way he did it. He had girls as well, so help me. And uh, I needed to find teachers. I needed to find people who could show me how to do this thing and I observed them and I talked with them, people that I respected and found out how to do it. I listened to their advice and watched what they did. And I didn't do that just so I could write a book about fathering or think about fathering. I did that because I wanted to be a father that was a good father. I wanted to walk in those ways. It wasn't just an academic kind of exercise. I wanted to make decisions and take on responsibilities and live the best way I could possibly live as a father. This learning is not simply passive. It's not simply academic. It's learning new ways so as to walk in them, to live them. And that's what Isaiah is imagining. And when you walk in a new way, when you live it, you invariably share it, not because you're actually trying to share it, but because you are an example to everybody else around you. You start to let people know this is not a, a particular program or an intentional effort. This is just a living exemplar that you become in the community. Um, I sometimes use the metaphor of human beings like being like stars or planets, and each person uh, has, or even a collection of people, has kind of a, a gravity to them. And we pull people into our circle of gravity and we influence them. And it's not anything in particular that you do, it's everything in general that you do. Or every word that you say, or actually it's even deeper than that, it's the things you believe. And this is really deep and hard to understand, but I actually see that the beliefs you hold which obviously shape every micro thing you do and every macro thing you do, influence the people around you. We are like planets that have gravity to them. And you know that uh, expression, that person has gravitas. Well, that's the same idea. And we influence, we share the news by living our life amongst our family and our community and our workplaces, and we let people know. 
And Isaiah says there's going to be a judgment, but it's not the judgment like we're used to. Uh, we think of judges as deciding between two sides that might have equal claims or unequal claims or whatever, an objective observer who says, um, yeah, you're right and you're wrong, you get something, you have to pay, whatever it might be. But this is a new kind of judgment that we're looking at here. This is the judgment of a life-giving way that shows up and outshines the life-crushing alternatives. This is a judgment that does not inflict punishment but exposes the destruction inherent in all choices that are not according to love. That's what this judgment is. It shows us what is real and shows us the inherent judgment in acting in ways that are not consistent in love. And this judgment enables us to see that it is far better to be friends with our neighbours than to be rivals or enemies. So much of our instinctual culture pits one person against another or one community against another or one nation against another and this is the energy and trajectory that is fueled by fear. To get beyond fear we need to discover a richness of the possibility of bringing life to one another, of enhancing and building life for one another. And you can hear this in Paul's letters. Just a quick sample of Paul's letters, certainly the, the second half of Paul's letters, first half full of theology and mixing up metaphors and stuff like that. But in the second half, you hear things like, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, give preference to one another and in honor. That's from Romans or again from Romans. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. And again, therefore accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. In Galatians, through love serve one another. In Ephesians, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. In uh, Colossians, being with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, forgive them. These sorts of things. Uh, in Thessalonians, therefore encourage one another and build up one another. There is no hint of rivalry here. The only desire is to see each one become more fully who Christ is calling them to be. Imagine a world where we did that. Can you imagine a world where people around you encouraged you and called you on and supported you to be the best that you could be? A new light would dawn. The light of God would dawn. There would no longer be the need to learn war. The massive investments we make in military arms and so forth could be rechanneled into life-giving enterprises. There would be a reverse vested interest. You wouldn't want to harm anybody, anybody because to harm anyone would be to take away somebody who wants to help you. And there would be this exponential change. Like, you might think, well, that's so far-fetched. How could that possibly ever happen? But I tell you, we glimpse it. We glimpse it every now and then. One of Tom and Lily's uh, workers, Misa, is returning to Japan in the next week or so. And yesterday afternoon, they had a little gathering out in front of the shop and invited the regulars to, who come to the cafe to just come and celebrate with Misa and send her off. They didn't have to do that. She's an employee. She did her work, they paid her, contract fulfilled. But there's this thing where we love one another and we want to do something that's good. And that creates a sense of community and people come in and gather around and enjoy being together and we encourage and spur. We do this with the nativity when we put on something like that or Anzac service or the ultimate Ultimo Bake Off when people come in and we share food together or indeed Passover where we retell that story. All sorts of little ways where we start to reverse the rivalry and fear mechanisms that are always around us and we replace them with encouragement and love messages so that the light of God might start to dawn. 
Because in the end, this is about trust, I think. We might be convinced that it is foolish to trust other people. But the deeper challenge is, can you trust the God who is bigger than human untrustworthiness? So that even when we are let down, or things work out differently to what we expect, we might be able to find the love and purpose of God in that circumstance. Because if we learn to do that, no one can stop us from loving and serving the world. No one can stop us from walking in the light of God. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your incredible love for us that sets us free to love the world. Teach us of your ways. Lead us in your paths that your light, may bright, light, your light might break forth over us and over the world. To the glory of your name. Amen.